welcome. Series two, episode eight. Euros has finished, seamlessly transitioning through British Grand Prix, British Open, Tour de France, Le Tour, Le Tour. into Tokyo 2020. I mean, what a time to be alive. What a time. And when people said to me it was going to be a summer of sport, I was like, is it? You know, it's the lockdown, we'll be able to get out. Euros hit. I'm in an absolute frenzy between the phone and what's on social media and the TV, having conversations, uh, completely immersed in football, completely immersed in Wimbledon, trying to tag team both of those on, on Super Saturday, if you like. Um, and then, yeah, Grand Prix, Tour de France. I downloaded the Olympics app the other day and it was asking me to pick my country. That was a tricky one. Ooh, ooh I know. where is your allegiances? I know. Well, obviously I flagged Ireland, but I'm going to know more of the sports and possibly people and coaches in um, in the GB. So I said to um, my wife, I was like, please, you download the app and follow Great Britain and let me know when everything's on and I'll do Ireland just because of <laughs> <laughs> but it was so cool to look at like so there's the three on three basketball that's in for the first mm. time there's a the skateboarding the climbing um you know s- some of the sports i've worked closer with that i know coaches are gone over there or some athletes i've maybe kind of tuned into those a little bit more as well as your standard ones that give you you know the athletics gives you a boost and uh swimming will give you a boost well it's it's been always in our house watching those kind of ones gymnastics judo uh so much so much mm. good so uh, yeah. Yeah. So and I guess insight from the camp with um, my wife currently over there. Um, she spent six hours yesterday sat in a corridor talking to different people. So they're in a hotel uh, where they're not allowed to leave the hotel. There's no communal areas. When you're in the hotel, you basically have to be in your room or the corridor. Wow. Um, gets a bus to the Olympic Village. So she's been in the Olympic Village today into, into the uh, Performance Lodge, as it's called. Um, she said it's a f- brilliant view of Tokyo Bay. Amazing. And then she goes to her room and like the view is like, like it's just like, look at that. <laughs> like, like that is basically just a brick wall. I'm uh, laughing, but it's not funny. But yeah, like that's um, the reality like of... So it's such think, a different you know you don't think so you don't like it i mean even looking online the excitement of people going away getting their kit going to tokyo the olympics the finally the olympics the fifth year of training and the hard kind of reality of yes there's some brilliant parts and the rings and taking pictures and the beautiful sights and i'm sure tokyo and japan are doing a fantastic job to set up there's a long day and six hours in a corridor and you know mm. a, view and abiding by really stringent rules that that's going to be testing especially in the role that Bex has out there anyway but yeah gosh. yeah it's definitely not I mean she did Rio in London but it's definitely not the experience that she thought she was going to be getting in Tokyo um, and certainly not as glamorous as you know we're going to see a glamorous side to the games mm. but that won't portray the reality I think for many of the people around the uh, the coaching support staff function of the athletes mm. and like what what i think of there is speaking of support staff is that like they'll have to cope going through that because they're supporting other people as well as trying to navigate it themselves and the aftermath then of an athlete that goes through something like this they've trained the extra year they've stretched themselves beyond the initial cycle mm. they have support some sports and organizations probably a little bit better uh, equipped when they come back but I'm thinking of those athletes then who come back who don't maybe perform to what they thought they were going to do and they don't have regular access to maybe a sport bike or a lifestyle advisor they might be transitioning out of the sport it's a massive undertaking isn't it it's a mm. yeah it's a, it's a tough world tough world but exciting I mean we will see yeah. the lights and the flash and the competition and all that which I'm really excited to see but absolutely just doing a little reality check well more insight will we have some sort of insight on a weekly basis can we, can we do well that? i don't and the, the <laughs> problem i've got is like the the women's hockey matches are like 1 30 2 o'clock in the morning and, and like she, she she gave me a team to be baseball cap and i feel like i'm under pressure now as, as an extension of the team to skip and watch a you've got to wear the hat the next time 
where we have our coach conversation next week and <laughs> we, we're going to do it the couple of hours after you wake up we'll do a morning session where you've been up all night watching <laughs> right, well the, the, uh, the the baseball cap got its first outing on saturday oh okay so wow. i was at my son's under seven football tournament his first football tournament mm. however he didn't play because we got pinged on Thursday night that he had to self-isolate. Right, okay. So he was super excited about playing on Saturday. Kibosh. So, well, because I'm going to help out with the coaching side of the, of the team next year, um, I went to the tournament with the kids. Our under sevens team, it's the, they've played three games ever. So with, you know, hundreds of people there, yeah 14 games across the two teams Ooh. um it was really interesting that you know this is one of those things that how well do we help coaches prepare kids to compete in an all-day sporting event um in terms of what do we need to do pre to help them what do we do on the day what does it look like at the end of the day really interesting and i think we do nothing, if not very little, to help them understand about what they're going to go and experience for the first time. I mean, listen, I just got my mind completely sparking there. One of the things I'd like to ask you is about the, the fact that it's under sevens. So we hear a lot of media and, and hype around, you know, participating, participating ages to start and all that. So is there something particular about the structure that was useful to maximize the enjoyment for that age group or things you'd tweak going forward? And then the other side um, is I went to, uh, not to track too much, but I went to a tournament recently and there was a woman coaching a group of basketball girls who had never coached them before. And I wondered what messages she thought were important, similar to say mm. coaching your, your team, your under sevens team, what messages are important to help them enjoy the game to maximize maybe strategically or tactically how they navigate the game in a shortcut way? Because you just want them to have an enjoyable experience and maybe not be, I don't know if it's outcome based, if there's restrictions on what happens in the tournament or fair play rules, but just, yeah. Any thoughts on either of those? Yeah. I mean, it was, it was fascinating to see. So there was one giveaway right at the start that, 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 that showed, right we were the team that had not played at tournaments before was because every other team had a gazebo oh, parents gosh. organized set up camp like we just had a scattering of parents on like service station chairs um and the odd rug but yeah so that was definitely a giveaway that we we were new to this um but it was it was set up in a way that they had six or seven 10 minute games, which is quite a lot of football for six and seven year olds. Um, and again, you, you definitely went into it seeing the kids teams that had done a few of these versus our kids that really hadn't done. Um, so it was, it was fascinating watching, you know, the kids, some of the teams that were super organized and structured you know, right, you're playing here, don't move, you're playing here, do this, pass this. And uh, I was I was working with one of the other one of the other dads who's kind of the manager or doing a lot of the admin stuff, Graham. And he's a smart man, I, I really like him, he's a nice guy. And uh, at one stage, like I said to him, Is that guy on the other side, is his voice annoying you as much as it's annoying me? Oh. He was and he's it's like, Oh, so pleased you said that. It's like, oh my god. And I said to I said to the parents that one of the lads I was stood with, Jim, I said, this is this is just PlayStation for dads. He was literally just moving the kids around the pitch on his joystick mm. at, uh, you know, X, right, get near the goal, shoot. Yeah, yeah, pass, 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 pass. Yeah, <laughs> literally telling the kids what to do every move, which was really interesting because because he, he only had five players and they were playing six aside. And this was the second last game Sorry, then, I'm sorry. He had five players six yeah. aside, and they had all those games for the day. Yeah. Oh so I don't know if he lost some players throughout the day because ah, okay, I, yeah. I, I don't know. Not, not like literally lost them. Like they just got injured. <laughs> <or whatever. I> <laughs> wow. Um, 
<laughs> too busy. <laughs> That's a different safeguarding thing. Um, but so at the start of the game, though, I walked over to him and said, look, uh, our kids, they're very new to this. Um, they've not won a match all day. We've scored three goals all day. I noticed that you've got five. Can we still play with six? And he said, we, we're we winning most matches four or five nil. Um, yeah, no problem at all. So he was semi-sensible about it, which was great. Mm. I mean, like after for four, uh, 10 minute games, after four minutes, we were five nil down. I oh. mean, it, it was like we'd suddenly just come across Barcelona. Um, but But it was really interesting that, you know, the approach, they were clearly well-drilled, a well-selected group of kids of that age group, but very very much different to how we were playing. Um, the, the focus for them was clearly on winning matches, scoring goals, mm -hmm. you know, pass here, run there, do this. Um, whereas we have a very different philosophy. And I said to the kids from the start, um, staying on the ball is what I want you to do today. And they were like, well, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, if you get the ball in our area, I said, uh, I want you to stay on it and dribble. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't care where you dribble. don't care what happens. I just want you to enjoy staying on the ball. If you see a pass that you want to make, awesome. But just stay on the ball and dribble. I said, what I don't want to see is you just kicking the ball off the pitch. I said, because what happens then? And I said, well, it's the other team's ball. Right, so we're just giving the ball away. Mm. So just stay on the ball. And then chatting to one of the other uh, one of the other parents, I'm one of the coaches. And he said, well, why? And I said, well, it's a lot easier to teach a kid to learn to pass the ball than it is to teach a kid to dribble. Wow. And I want them to have the confidence that they're never going to get moaned at, they're never going to get whinged at, stay on the ball. Get comfortable with having a ball at your feet. So, very different approaches. You know, to me, like, um, it just makes so much sense. The enjoyment part. That's what they want to do. They want to get from A to B. They want to feel like they can take someone on, mm. make up the story in their head, whatever that story may be, versus somebody who's played a role. I saw it a lot when I was younger, when we had, um, say, it was playing younger, I was developing into this, a senior player, and we'd bring up under 16s to train but they'd have a role and mm. I always questioned you know she she can jump she can pass she can run she's a you know good box strong girl to box out we'll use her for this but that was just that development piece and that's you know she sacrificed maybe another training session with her team or the next immediate age group up because you know the coach wanted to use her for a certain role in a certain position you know so mm. you know is that actually development if the coach has learned how to play the tournament just like you're learning you know you're recalling something and I know it's linked to your learning piece there a little bit but is there something around if I can play left wing because actually this is something that's really interesting and I know uh, going off tangent slightly here but uh, when I dived into the world of football last year I, I realized that so many people only play one position but in basketball, like, fortunately, unfortunately for me, because of different heights and different teams, like I would have played a, an inside player and be very small for that a power, a power forward when I was with the school or club team. But internationally, I was teeny tiny, so I had to play point guard or a two spot, a shooter. So it was a given that I would know the, know the spots, know the plays for that position. Yeah. And that was like, oh, I just play, I just play in the backs, just play here if they wing back. Um, what? But what if you... What if you go? What happens when you get near the goal? Like, do you, you know? So is that something around this guy restricting their movement and playing and doing the, the Xbox version of you go here and, and we've won and I'm chilled about that, but actually, mm. yeah. And so then, okay, go back to like how you, how you would coach it, whether it's you or kind of advice for people who are not just football, but like engaging with groups for the first time of that age, mm. competition set up, like are the things leaning towards their holistic experience and development or is it something that helps the enjoyment by them feeling like there's a competency thing and the confidence can grow from achieving something yeah it's tricky um and i think how you find that balance because again kids can get some confidence from success 
And sometimes that's in the scoreline, but sometimes it's just in how they play. Yeah. And it's quite tricky when you then have to um, to do something that's going to impact on that yeah. and to link your last point. So uh, I, I said to all the kids at the start, you're all going to play in every position. Okay. So with seven games, every kid is going to play midfield. You're going to play in forward. You're going to be a defender and you're going to be a goalkeeper. Right. So I've got I've got one um, one kid Sam, and I knew it was going to happen. So now this is this that dilemma that exactly that you talked about there, right? So I made Sam cry, okay, and I didn't stop it when I know it was going to happen. So I said, "This is the team for the next game, Sam. You're playing in goal. I don't want to play in goal." We said it start. Everybody will take their turn. Um, other children need to play in different positions starts crying so i so i now have this real kind of battle of like do i give in to sam because he's now emotional and crying because he doesn't want to play in goal but everybody has to take the turn and learn different positions and uh and then i think we lost that game four nil and he came off the pitch crying saying we lost because of me um and interestingly he's as it stands at the moment, he's probably one of our top two, top three outfield players. He's tiny, but he's got brilliant feet. He doesn't run, he just glides. It's, like it's, it's poetic. Hmm. Um, but I made him cry because I told him he has to go and go. That is so interesting. So were you caught there between that, like, you know, the, the sharing part and then the dad part of the emotions of a young child or... Did, was it leaning even was it was was the tears because he was afraid of being on goal and the impact of a ball coming at him at speed what was you know or oh I want to be out and I want to be scoring because that's what I'm good at like yeah there was all of those oh I think God. you know you've got this nurturing side as a parent that's saying like I'm clearly making a child cry here yeah and knowingly that that's going to happen mm -hmm. and then there's the you know, it's not a strong driver, but there's that ego part of me that's saying, well, he's our, in that group, is like, he's our best outfield player. <laughs> you know, so if we want to get any success as a scoreline, mm. that's going to be influenced heavily by what Sam can do out on the pitch. And he's definitely not going to do that when he's in goal. Yeah. So there's there's lots of different things going on in in your head at one moment and you're trying to trying to make the best decision that you can of which none of them are correct yeah. uh, they're all an experience though and I'm, I'm just thinking of the amount of detail that's going on in your head that other people may or may not experience that like they you know that it is important to think about it you know it is mm. important to notice what's happened to, to kind of dissect it a little bit to get through it to manage those situations where there may not be a positive scoreline success but you can reframe the success to something else and you know, have that follow-up conversation with Sam or the rotating player of the upset player. But you know, I've I've, I've definitely experienced in in my own sport. Just do it, just do it, because this is what we said, and nobody's given it a second thought. And it kind of makes me feel resentful, as opposed to somebody going, "Well, this is why we're doing it, and this is you know, you taking the time to explain that everybody's rotated in, and you know what mm. we're doing, and the, it isn't your fault. We're all working together." But yeah, that's. That's interesting. Wow. It's tricky then emotionally for me. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, yeah. And so what was the outcome of the whole day like? What's your summary of it? Good, a good, useful experience? What are you thinking? Yeah, I think it was, well, they're always good experiences, I think. Okay. Regardless of how well you do, I think. I think you, you can pull something from it. And what I think it was good for, and I, I probably could have predicted it would happen, but I wanted to go through, let the kids go through it, was they turn up at 9.15, first game is 10.15, they spend one hour before hyper, they play the game, yeah. they come off, go and have a drink, the other team go and play the game, they've got 45 minutes till the next game, they're hyper for 45 minutes, mm. so they've now been hyper for two hours, so by game six, they are on their <laughs> knees. So, it, and I could have absolutely predicted this was going to happen. 
Mm. So one of the key learnings for me is helping the kids. And we talked about it later on in the day. What have you been doing today? Uh, well, we were running around lots. Okay. What's happened to our energy levels? So we talk about a car being full of petrol. Mm. And when you drive, your petrol goes down. Mm. So what happened to your petrol levels this morning? Oh, we used our petrol really quick. Okay. How did you refill your petrol levels? We had ice cream. <laughs> at 10 15. You know, so. Oh, yeah. So there's some, like, you know, mm. some parental nutrition stuff. You know, if you're going to fuel your kid appropriately, I want kid to have about five bottles of Lucas Aid Sport. It's not going to be oh, helpful. Jeez. Um, you know, others would have done it really well across the yeah yeah thousand kids that were there on a day or however many it was but yeah. so there was lots going on i think that was really interesting but i think um for the first experience they had a great time um uh, a few of them scored some goals and probably you know learned lots about winning and losing um i think in 14 matches we won one game okay um which is interesting because that doesn't i don't personally feel like i'm a bad coach on the back of it um, no, it didn't even blink. I just think how exciting it must have been in the majority of households packing a bag for that. I'm going off oh, to yeah. the tournament. Oh, do I have socks or who provides the kit or what will I bring? Will I bring my wash bottle? Oh, I'm so yeah. like, you know, then coming home exhausted and then running through the games the next day. Mm. Like, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I think I mentioned it earlier on uh, at work is like my favourite moment was like one of the games was going on and the number eight on the other team was just like running around like in circles and like the ball was like on the on our side of the pitch and like there was no one else near him like, i'm looking past the players going what's he doing to then see like like th this butterfly in the air and this kid's just given up on football is just chasing this butterfly in circles it's just hilarious and oh, the innocence, the innocence and beauty of that. I would yeah. love to have seen if there was a parent there and if it was a if it was a soccer mom or dad or uh yeah, parental figure just kind of going, What are you what are you doing? Get up on the ball. <laughs> oh, I, I mean there was some very interesting like kind of input from the sidelines, as you can imagine, but at that moment they would have been fascinated. Oh. I did have a great chat with some grandparents though that were there oh. from the other team. Right. Uh, they just happened to be stood next to me where I was where I was stood and their grandson it's like some of the people down on our further on down the touch I'm like oh yeah she's good wow she's really good and it was a boy with long hair right um Ned uh and was quite talented but again, we kind of, you know, not something we've really touched upon, but that kind of assumption of looks a little bit like a little girl, but actually was a little boy, but just happened to have long hair. Yeah. So, so went in with a she as opposed to a they or, um, yeah. yeah, it was fascinating kind of seeing some of those things play out as well. Definitely. And like, I mean, in football, it's definitely, correct me if I'm wrong, this, it's common that on, at underage previously maybe years gone by when there was less female teams or girls teams to play with that they would have played with the boys teams yeah yeah still do now still do now mm -hmm. um and then I, I guess the other side is the pronoun um side of things and all that's happening with gender um, and identity like having an opportunity for people to kind of be aware but when you're looking at a different age group or maybe um culturally before people weren't exposed to different things um and scenarios but yeah that's that's interesting, isn't it? Did you kind of mm. correct them or what do, did you? Uh, yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but, and it was because um, he had a penalty against us uh, that a couple of them went, oh, oh, she was unlucky there. And I said, it's a little boy. Oh. Uh, and they were like, oh, well, just I assumed. Yeah. Well, we did. Yeah. I, I asked that because um, a friend of mine has... Um, has a daughter who's cut her hair short or shortish and um, plays football, plays really well, scored a goal on the team. And then the coach of the opposite team started to berate um, her and the other coach saying, get her off. She shouldn't be on this team anyway. Um, you know, blah, blah, blah. A lot of really horrible things that I, I won't repeat. 
um, and it was really ignorant and no one corrected him like the parents did but there you know there was no kind of repercussions for that ignorance so it's still it's still rife but uh, fair play to you for addressing mm. that and helping them um so what else has been going on this week so you had that tournament yeah tournament first team match in the afternoon went straight to there and then um had a great conversation with a big influence of my coaching in my views of coaching there was a guy that i used to work with at, at the fa and he now works at top been at top for eight years mm. and we had a long conversation lovely to catch up with him like he just like he said to me like, i don't know how old he is now John Old Press, he's, he's got to be late 60s, I suppose. And he, he was getting frustrated with some stuff that's happening in coaching at the moment. And he said, but that's not my problem to worry about anymore. He said, that's people like you that got to worry about that. And I went, no, John. I said, no, it is your fault that I now worry about this kind of stuff. Because <laughs> you're the one that influenced me. Yeah. Um, and uh, and he, he was doing some work with the, the academy coaches at Tottenham. Oh. And he said he was just working on these three questions when they're working with the kids in the academy. And, and I wrote them down, so I was just like, oh, I mean, you just get gems every time you speak to him. And he just said, and I think this, this should go across the, all of coaching. He said to me, um, who are the players? What do they need? How can we help? Like, so I then placed that in my under seven world. Who are the players? Well, they're my son and his football mates, what do they need? Well, sometimes they need their laces done up. Sometimes they need to talk about behaviour or managing energy and a little bit of football stuff, maybe. How can we help? Well, we can talk and we can explain and we can listen to the kids and et cetera. But then I flip that to the first team where we've got, you know, ex-professional players. Who are the players? Well, they have a real mixture from office jobs to all sorts of labourers and different things. What do they need? Position specific. Some of them just need to know that they can connect. How can we help? Listen, ask, exactly the same. But I love those three questions. Yeah, Who are the players? What do they need? How can we help? And it goes across all sports. Yeah. You know, like, and it's a nice, I, I say pre-season, go back to team sport, but it's a nice opener for a season for a new coach coming into an environment to know that those are the three questions you're, basing and building upon as a, mm. a group um and then there's something about the value of well particular age, age groups might value it a little bit more or differently you know them are being asked the question like encouraging more questions to come around how do you like to be coached and all um you know what can i do for you how can i support you maybe you want to explicitly ask those three questions openly to the players but if you're thinking about them and discussing them you're going to have more questions that you you want to ask and share aren't you and be more mm. proactive to engage Gosh, they're, they're brilliant. I love that. Yeah. What a lovely way to finish off the session. There yeah, we go. Think about it. Um, at Coach Convo, you can find us here on Twitter. Doo -doo -doo. Uh, coachconversation at gmail.com. Join us next week. If you have any feedback or comments, we'd love to hear them. If you have any topics you'd like to explore or anything from social media that has drawn your attention, do share it with us. And we'd love to yeah, have a conversation about it and, and share our world and our perspective. So have a lovely week and we'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.